It's Metacosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our rheumatology playlist. In the previous video, we started talking about gout. Today, I'll tell you how can you diagnose gout. With that being said, now let's get started. Before we get started, let me answer the question of the previous video. How can you tell if the patient is an overproducer of uric acid or an under-excretor of uric acid? Easy. You measure the amount of uric acid in the urine in a 24-hour period. If you find the uric acid in the urine low, therefore, by definition, the patient is an under-excretor. But if there's lots of uric acid in the urine, then definitely the patient is an overproducer. What do you mean by too much? More than 800 milligrams per 24 hours. I strongly recommend that you watch these videos in order in my playlist called Rheumatology. We have talked about all of these before. If you haven't watched my previous videos, I don't know what you're doing with your life. Crystalline arthropathy, arthro joint, pathy pathology, and it has crystals. So inflammatory arthritis caused by deposition of microscopic crystals into joints and other tissues such as muscle, tendon, kidney, bursa, etc. Gout is an inflammatory arthritis, affects the first metatarsophalangeal joint, it's monoarticular, therefore it's asymmetrical, it could be acute or chronic, the acute is called acute gouty arthritis or acute gouty attack, the chronic is called chronic to facious gout, joint disease is peripheral and non-autoimmune. Let's add all of the previous words together to have a definition. Gout is a crystalline inflammatory asymmetrical monoarthritis that could be primary or secondary, acute or chronic, in overproducer or under excretors of uric acid, involves small peripheral joints, specifically the first metatarsophalangeal joint or your big toe, due to deposition of microscopic crystals, they are monosodium urate, and they are more common in males than females. Hyperuricemia is not the same as gout. A normal serum level of uric acid does not rule out gout. Gout is inflammatory, pain and swelling, you can have fever, affect small joints, pain at night, chronic disease with acute flares, when you have acute flares you'll find neutrophils, joint fluid analysis will show an inflammatory pattern, inflammatory pattern, you have white blood cells between 2000 and 100,000, you have high ESR and CRP. They are acutely elevated in acute gout and chronically elevated in chronic gout. We have discussed this case before. This is a patient with an acute gouty attack. What's the next step? You have to aspire the joint. Arthrocentesis with joint fluid analysis. Why? To rule out septic arthritis first and then to diagnose or to confirm the diagnosis of gout. Once you have your diagnosis, you can start your treatment. And we start by treating the acute attack first, and then later we manage the patient chronically by reducing their uric acid level in the plasma. We have talked about the risk factors of gout before in the previous video, please watch it. And don't forget, gout is not common in premenopausal women. Why? Because estrogen is urecosuric. It gets rid of the uric acid in the urine, which is huge, by the way. And we will use this fact in trying to treat the chronic gout patients by giving them urecosuric drugs. What are the causes of gout? Could be primary or secondary. We have talked about them in the previous video. What is the pathophysiology of acute gout? In acute gout, you have increased amount of solute. What do you mean by solute? In this case, it's sodium urate because it's gout. If it's pseudogout, that's a totally different story, usually calcium, dihydro, whatever, crystals. But now we have sodium urate, monosodium urate. Cool. Depending on pH and pressure and temperature, we form nucleation point. And if you remember the flask experiment from the previous video, we had nucleation points. Nucleation points equals crystal formation. The fate of the crystal will depend on what happens. If the patient and the doctor manage to decrease the uric acid level, the crystals will dissolute. They will just disappear. Wonderful. Risk factors such as trauma, inflammation, surgery, or rapid drop of uric acid because the doctor was an idiot. This can lead to crystal shedding from the cartilage to the joint or the purse, and this is ugly. A different input will give you a different output. What will you see in the patient with acute gout clinically? The cardinal signs of inflammation, which include redness, hotness, swelling, pain, loss of function. And in Latin, this is ruber calor tumor dollar functual essay. I'm having a blast. Systemic symptoms, fever, confusion, and even delirium. Yes, it can happen because the pain is so severe. During recovery, disquamation and itching are common. 
We have talked about the difference between podagra and tophi in the previous video. Podagra, big toe, acute gout, mostly in the big toe. Second most common location, knee, you have neutrophils. Tophi, they mean stone, chronic gout, chronic tophaceous gout, PIP and MTP in the hand and the feet. The second most common is ear pinna, the olecranon of your elbow and your prepatellar bursae. These are rocks, hard, yellowish white chalky nodules multinucleated giant cells of granulome because this is chronic. Signs and symptoms of acute and chronic gout were discussed in the previous video. Please don't forget that gout can give you five different conditions. Now to today's topic. How can you diagnose gout? We need history, physical exam, and the labs. Labs, what do you mean by labs? The most common thing, the most important thing is joint aspiration, and then serum, urine tests, and imaging. We will need a rheumatologist, a pathologist, and a radiologist. How can you diagnose gout? History, male, in his 40s, meat, beer, seafood, drugs, trauma, surgery, fructose, all of these are risk factors around 40, doesn't have to be 40. Physical, acute gout, warm, red, tender, swollen joint, the big toe is on fire. Labs, joint aspiration is the most important thing, arthrocentesis with joint fluid analysis. And then in the serum and the urine, what will we do? Uric acid in the serum, uric acid in the urine, this is not reliable in the acute attacks. Also, we will need glucose, renal function tests, and lipid Y to diagnose concurrent metabolic problems, ESR and CRP, and Y blood cells expect to have neutrophilia in the blood if you have acute gout. And then imaging, X-ray and ultrasound. An X-ray in acute gout, normal. Chronic gout will demarcate erosions. These are the tophi. The tophi can cause soft tissue swelling on X-ray. An ultrasound will visualize the small crystals. A common exam question is, what if the uric acid crystals are so small and you could not palpate them on physical exam? Do an ultrasound. Joint aspiration is the most important thing. What are you expect to see? Intracellular, needle-shaped, monosodium urate crystals that are strongly, negatively birefringent under polarized microscopy. This is just huge. Before you try to mess around with pathology, you need to understand the physiology. What's the normal joint fluid aspirate? When I aspire a joint, what is expected? The color should be colorless or straw colored. Aspect clear, not turbid. Consistency, thin and stringy. Viscosity, moderate. White blood cell with differential, less than 200. With PMNs, less than 25%. RBCs, non-existent or one at the very most. Free of bacteria, free of fungi, free of viruses. Glucose, slightly lower than that of the blood. Cell count in the joint fluid analysis. Normally less than 200. Non-inflammatory, less than 2000 per microliter. Inflammatory between 2,000 and 75,000, some people say between 2,000 and 100,000, purulent is more than 100,000. And this is seen in septic arthritis. Which one is gout? Gout is here. How about a rheumatoid arthritis flare? It's also here. Mr. Osteo, osteoarthritis is here. Microscopic examination. Now if you see crystals, you get them to the lab. Polarized light microscopy, negative birefringent, this is gout. Positive birefringent, this is pseudogout. And here is a table to compare between the joint fluid analysis in each case. This is gout. Clarity, translucent to opaque, and you can say turbid or white. Why turbid? Because of the neutrophil. Why white? Because of the crystals. Color, yellow to opalescent. White blood cells, 2,000 to 75,000. Opalescent is huge because, you know, these are crystals. So opalescent is like multiple colors together. PMN is more than 50 because it's acute. Culture is negative because there is no freaking bacteria. Okay, in order for your test to be diagnostic, you need to find at least one intracellular monosodium urate crystal. What do you mean by intracellular? Inside a neutrophil or greater than or equal three extracellular monosodium urate crystals. You can obtain the crystals from a joint, bursa, or a tophus. Wherever you can do it, do it, doofus. These crystals are needle-shaped, monosodium urate, strongly negatively birefringent under plain polarized light. Now, what the flip is birefringence and what the frick is plain polarized light? This is physics, baby. Pay attention. This next segment is not going to be easy. It requires you to do without your stupidity for a while. After the segment, you can reclaim your stupidity back, just like how the proximal convoluted tubule reclaimed its bicarbonate back. Birefringence. What does refringence mean? Refraction. So let's go back to this. This is reflection and this is a refraction. 
Does anyone remember physics? By the way, both of them happen at the same time. Like, it's not like it's either reflection or... No, they happen together. There is reflection, there is refraction, and there is even absorption within the surface. That's why when you shine a light on a surface for a long period of time, it gets hot because of heat, because of absorption. Let's focus on refraction. From the first medium to the second medium, of course, the speed of light here is different from the speed of light here. That's why there is a refraction. And it depends on the speed of light within the medium, which depends on the refractive index of the medium. Each medium or each substance has a different refractive index. Water is different from oil is different from crystals. By refraction is the same as by refringence. What's that? Having a refractive index that depends on the polarization of light. This is not just one refraction, this is two refractions in the same substance. So here is the first substance which is non birefringent light in, refraction, and refraction again, but this is just one ray. Here, a birefringent material such as the gouty crystals, the monosodium urease, light in, two rays, and two outcomes. And this is called horizontal polarization, and this is vertical polarization. I cannot draw 3D, but imagine this is one of them and the other one of them is like this. One is vertical, one is horizontal. Why the flip does that happen? Imagine that this is your uric acid crystals, lovely needle shaped. Within it, there are atoms. Some of the atoms are horizontal and some of the atoms are arranged vertically. And that's why you have birefringence. So if this is a birefringent material, such as the crystals, you will have vertical polarization and horizontal polarization and the degree or the angle between them is 90. Normally, if it's just mono, like not birefringent, just a regular material with no birefringence, you will get refraction index, which is N. But if you have something like a crystal and you have two rays, you should calculate delta N, which is the difference between the two refraction indices inside a birefringent material. So each substance that's birefringent will have a different delta N and you should be able to calculate delta N and you'll find that delta N for gout is different from delta N for pseudogout is different from delta N to any other crystal. Correct. But do you really think that doctors whose primary reason for going into medical school is that they suck at math are going to measure the delta N and the speed of light in different media in order to diagnose the patient? Oh, give me a break. We want to make it easy so that every dadgum lab-coated human being who has an MD in DUMB can figure it out. So how do we do it? Use colors. If the color is yellow, it's gout. If the color is blue, it's pseudogout. Look at you! But there's a caveat. First, let's know the difference between a non-polarized, good old regular visible light and a polarized light. What's the difference? This light goes in many directions. Yeah, it's still a straight line, but in many different directions. But this polarized light is only in one direction, like this. A laser beam is an example of polarized light. If it's a true laser, not the 50 cent pen that you got from the store and you thought that was a laser. No, you have been marketed by a snake oil salesman. Not, not, not every red light is a laser. So here is a polarized light that goes only in one direction. And these are the gout crystals. If the gout crystals are parallel to the source of the light, like this one, they will be yellow in color. But put them perpendicular and the same dead gum gouty crystals will become blue. And this is what we mean by by refringent. Let's do the opposite. Let's make the source of light or the beam or the transducer vertical. Now, when the crystals are perpendicular to the source, they are blue. When they are parallel, they are yellow. Now, pseudogout is different also, by the way. Have you noticed that the previous gouty crystals were needle shaped, but these ones are rhomboid? Cool. Polarized light, parallel, blue. Perpendicular, yellow. Now please change the direction of the plain polarized light. And now, if they are like this, they are parallel, blue. If they are like this, perpendicular, yellow. So here is everything you need to know. Gout crystals, uric acid crystals, they are needle shaped. And they are yellow when they are parallel to the red compensator filter. And that we call this negative birefringent. The mnemonic is when they lay low parallel they are yellow and this is gout negative next is pseudogout which is positive through so the p with the p pseudogout is positive by refringent it's rhomboid shaped crystals not needle shape and blue when parallel 
yellow with perpendicular, this is positive birefringence. Another teeny tiny difference for the nerds, the gout is called strongly negative birefringent, but those are called weakly positive birefringent. Here is a question for you that your professor might ask. These crystals were aspired from a patient's joint. They are exposed to plain polarized light. What's the diagnosis? If you say, oh, it's gout, shut up. If you say, no, it's pseudogout, also shut up. I cannot answer the question until you tell me the direction of the plain polarized light. So here is the direction, baby. The red compensator filter with the plain polarized light is this, from east to west. And these crystals are yellow. So is it gout or pseudogout? And the answer is gout. If the direction of the compensator was like this, from north to south, this will be pseudogout. So it freaking depends. Unfortunately, most students and professors don't know this fact. So they will give you this picture and the question, I'll tell you, yeah, gout or pseudogout, enjoy yourself. I cannot answer the question. But lucky for you, you can look at the stem of the question. Oh, this patient had a beer party yesterday, ate lots of meat and seafood, and now he woke up early in the morning because of pain in his big toe. Gout. The next patient has a history of hemochromatosis and hyperparathyroidism, and he has chondrocalcinosis on x-ray of the knee. Pseudogout. So how we diagnose gout? History, physical lab. We are done with the joint aspiration. Let's talk about serum and urine tests. Please don't make this mistake. A normal serum uric acid level does not exclude gout. More than 75% of patients with hyperuricemia are asymptomatic with no gout. There is no correlation whatsoever between the uric acid level and the acute gouty attack. Oftentimes, during an acute attack, serum uric acid could be normal or low. The uric acid level tends to decrease at the same moment you develop the acute attack. So, let's say a patient, asymptomatic, uric acid level is 15. Okay. Now they will develop an acute attack. Oh, it's very painful, doctor. It's not uncommon to see the uric acid level drop from 15 to like eight or seven. So measuring the uric acid level during the acute attack is not the best idea ever. You can still do it, but it's not that helpful. So what does a high plasma uric acid mean? It means that the patient is at risk. It doesn't necessarily guarantee an acute attack. It does not, of course, confirm the diagnosis. We have talked about ESR and CRP before, they are acute phase reactants, so acute inflammation equals high ESR and CRP, they correlate with the disease activity, they correlate with the response to therapy, but they have no diagnostic value, not to mention prognostic value. ESR and CRP may be sensitive for an acute inflammation, but they are not specific, they can be high in otitis, encephalitis, urethritis, inflammatory arthritis, including gout. My premium cardiac pharmacology course is on sale right now at medicosusperfectionalis.com. Currently, it's the cheapest it had ever been. How can you treat the acute gouty attack? How can you treat the chronic gout? It's going to be the topic of the next video. Questions of the day. Is it possible to encounter an acute polyarticular gout? I've told you that gout is monoarticular. Can it be polyarticular? That's the question too. Is aspirin a good idea or a bad idea for gout patients? Let me know the answer in the comment section. You will find the answer in the next video. Thank you so much, people, for subscribing, sharing, and supporting. It means a lot to me. Thank you. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. You can get my cardiac pharmacology course here. Thank you so much for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.